Hello, and welcome to Scaling Enterprise Agility, a podcast all about how businesses can be really intentional about their ways of working and be more responsive to what's going on in the market. I'm Alexis Williams, Head of Strategic Alliances at Atlassian. I'm here with my business partner, Christian Kelly of Accenture, and today we are joined by special guest, Fonz Morris, Lead Product Designer at Netflix. And together, we are sitting down live in San Jose talking about value stream management. One of the things I found absolutely delightful about you um, is that you can also go from like user research and design at the level of like flows and all of that, but then you got really hard nosed talking about commercials and how you think about that as a product designer and revenue and the business side of things. So, so, so talk about that. How, like for you personally, how did you get to being somebody who can go from there to there, from like, here's how we make money to here's how we're designing the perfect flows or the best flows for customers. So I wasn't always the business guy. I was actually the product guy. I've been fortunate enough to be a part of two startups. And in both of those startups, I was, you know, startups. I had every startup title, head of product, creative design, chief product officer, co-founder. I was the product guy. Like, don't bring me into the meetings with the money. Just make sure my check is there. I trust you guys to figure out the funding because I don't want y'all in my design meetings and talking engineering. I got this. I don't want you in my product meetings, so I'm not going to be in your business meetings, mm -hmm. but we're all going to meet at this crossroads and we're all going to go buy Lambos together, right? Well, we... <laughs> We met at the crossroads, but we didn't go buy lampposts together. The business actually wasn't developed enough to, to, to stand on its own. So the product was, but the business wasn't. And I unfortunately had to go back into corporate America for a couple of years. And then I went back into the entrepreneur space again and did it a second time and did the same thing again. Let me just build a product because it's hard to build a product. Like that's a very unique skill. You can't just, and not many people are going to raise their hand and say, I'll take on the responsibility of building a web, iOS, and Android platform. That means that people could use and that it'll work and all this type of stuff. So I felt pride in playing that role because it's a very complicated role. And I let somebody else handle the business again. And then after the business didn't make it the second time, I just vowed to myself. I will never, ever not be at the conversation about business. I will never only be the product person, ever. I actually, I'll double down on that and say, I'm going to be the business person. I'm going to learn everything about business. <laughs> I'm going to learn all the terms. I'm going to learn everything that I wish I would have known from my previous businesses, which was fantastic because it led to me actually now being a LP in a venture fund and me being a VC and me doing a ton of angel investing as well as angel mentoring and just being super involved on the business side, not just from the product space, but from the, so what is our user, like who's gonna use this and how much money are they gonna spend and how big is this market and who's our competitors and how did you come up with this price? All of these questions that really matter, you don't even need to get to the design side if you haven't figured out none of this mm -hmm fundamental business stuff. And I think a lot of product teams just jump straight to the product and they do like I did. And they just be like, well, somebody will figure out the business or you kind of figure out the business a little bit. And we're just going to go build cool things. Yeah, somebody no. Out the truck, it'll be fine. Right. No, no, that's not it. And I think I, I've been able to help Netflix, Coursera, all the smaller businesses, the VC firms I've worked with a lot more by having almost that equal balance of I can sit at the table with the business operators and the the C-suite and then immediately spin my seat around and now I'm at the product spot, but I'm kind of that conduit between the business and the product side where I can easily explain to my team, this is what we want to do. Here's why we want to do it. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's the impact that we'll have. So it's almost like that being a playmaker, I think that's what you said. Being a playmaker is really important as opposed to just only playing offense or only playing defense. It's like, I want to play offense and defense, and I want to help the coach call the play if I have to, and I'm cheering you up on the sideline if I have to, or I'm picking you up if you got injured, or I'm like yelling at you if you're not listening. You know, I'm doing whatever I think the business or the team or the product needs to be successful. And to be honest with you, more product and more design people have to understand 
the business side of it because you can just be way more impactful. And I think it helps you make better decisions with the solutions you're coming up with when you really understand what's the problem and what's going on here and what does success really look like? Like I was really impressed with something we were, we were talking about last night where you were talking about, yeah, there's customer value creation in your sign up process or been taking a credit card or not taking a credit card or logging in and stuff like that. Like as a product designer, what do you, where is your boundary of what you do for customer value creation versus somebody else on the team? Like, how does that work for you all? I think it's, I mean, it's just so broad once again, as opposed to like some organizations, I think they're so overly structured. I feel like Netflix has given me the chance to put my hands in so many different things. I've touched so many parts because at the end of the day, remember, I'm trying to keep our customers happy. Mm -hmm. And there's different stages of our customers' life cycle. We have what we consider as never members. That's somebody who has never had Netflix before, right? So if you've never heard of Netflix, somebody just told you about it, and you type in Netflix.com or you download the app on your phone, it is now my team's job to figure out how to get you comfortably into the platform. Every step of that, whether it's it's too hard, there's too many steps in the sign-up process, to this text was too small to read for somebody who needed larger text, to on a television, I was getting confused on where my mouse was, because all of this is user experience, but remember, these are the people that haven't even signed up yet you haven't even, you're not even a customer yet we but you, you, but you won't yet. become a customer yeah, yeah. but you won't become a customer like you won't become a customer if i can't convert you into the platform successfully so all of that matters to me what messaging do you read when you get to netflix.com are we speaking to you are we saying too much are we showing you enough information to make you want to hit that red button and getting to the sign up flow now that you're in the sign up flow, am I giving you too much information? Am I giving you enough to make you want to progress to the next step? Is this too overwhelming for you? Are we al like allowing you to, to move from your TV to your phone to continue to sign up if you're more comfortable on your phone? So all of this stuff. And then when you think of, I was just talking to somebody on my team, the complexities behind the payments of Netflix. Most Americans think of, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and few people may still think of Discovery, right? That's in the States. Now, like I said, Netflix is in 190 countries. There's some people that still pay for Netflix with cash. Who, who knows that? All right, how do you pay for Netflix? Because you go to the corner store and you pay the corner store and the corner store pays a Netflix bill for you. That's in unique use. Once again, this is considered as an edge case. Right. So now, but... How do you handle that on the platform if you're going to pay in cash and we accept card? So now do we need to tell you that you need to go to the store first and do you sign up at the store? There's so many different things that we have to worry about. And remember, this is still you have not signed up yet. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about all of this just to get you even to the point where you like, you know what? I'm convinced I'm going to sign up. Oh, wait, the most complex part of Netflix is the plan grid. What plan are you going to select? That's the most sensitive real estate of all of Netflix because it's so critical at that moment of like, well, how do we get you to pick the right plan? Because we because we only want you in the right plan. We don't want you to pick the higher price plan just to make us more money because all you're going to end up doing is downgrading or canceling. Mm -hmm. We want you to get into the right plan. So what's the right amount of information to show you to help you figure out this is the plan that's right for you and your family and we give you enough of the features that you say, okay, this is valuable for me. I want to pull out my credit card and actually pay. All right, just so for our listeners, though, two things that do, like accountability, I just heard, like, and I've heard it from you all up, all the time about accountability, right? And cross-functional and the ability to reach back in to multiple different parts to break silos and get into somebody. Like, that's, that's a cultural thing for your company, right? That is like, it's part of the ethos. I can reach in and anywhere. Right? Anywhere, any, I mean, people know me for that. People on my team are surprised how many people I know. And it's like, because I'm not afraid to reach out. As soon as I have a slight question that I can't answer, why would I try to yeah. not find an answer? And the answer is, let me, reach. you know how many Slack messages got, people have gotten from me of like, hey, what's up? It's Fonz. And they're like, uh, hey, Fonz. They're like, here we go. It's Fonz. Or even just a random person. They're like, hey, 
Fonz, what's up? And I'm like, product designer, overall monetization. I'm working on some stuff and I'm guessing this may be your team that might be able to help with that. A lot of fishing. I like fishing. It's fine. It's fine. I'm fishing all the time because there's been some times that I have fished and caught a massive whale. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did that. As opposed to being like, oh, I'm too afraid to throw my hook in the water. I'm never going to catch anything. I'm like, look, throw it. We'll see because it's hard to know who has what knowledge. The only way that you're going to find out is by asking. And we do have a culture that's very supportive. I, I want to say that's one of the things that I am like 100% bullish on that Netflix is if you reach out for answers to questions or help for something, somebody's going to help you somewhere, somehow, without a doubt. I've never felt I've asked a question and just been completely ignored or just made to feel like my question wasn't important or nobody cared or anything like that. Nope. Not at Netflix, I'll say. But you definitely have that very deep, like, curiosity, oh. like, learner through and through. Yeah, I mean, that's, it, like... Yes. Answers. I got that as my my review because we do 360 reviews every year where you ask nine to 10 people that you work with to give you feedback on you for the year. It's not what did I do wrong or where did I mess up? It's Christian. As my partner for the last year, here's some Netflix values that I associate with. Do you think I've lived up to those? Do you think there's ways I can live up to them more? And a lot of the feedback that I got from my partners was like, we just really valued your curiosity. Like you come to the table with questions. And I think when you come to the table with questions, it's almost like showing you care because you either thought about it or you're thinking about it. And then depending on the level of question you ask, it's like, wow, you really thought about this. Or even how you ask the question could be an example of your, your passion for something. So it's almost like curiosity is a really strong trait to have in tech because it's forever evolving and being innovative. So you got to ask these questions. Somebody, I feel like Netflix hired me to ask these, these questions and that's why I asked them. And I feel all of my users, all of our users want me to continue to ask these questions. This is my lifestyle. This is what I do. So I may think about a question when I can't sleep at night cause I'm just up and I'm like, what do premium users really want from Netflix? I'm not going to just lay in the bed and say, block out everything Netflix, don't, don't, don't. No, it's not like that when you're as in it as I am, you know what I mean? So I'm always thinking about work because it's fun to me. It's what I love to do. It's like my bread and butter, but it's my passion. I'm a, like, I'm a self-taught designer, so to I'm constantly reflecting back on like, damn, I can't even believe sometimes that I'm here making these decisions and I'm in these kind of conversations when you think of how far my journey has come and how far I have to go so it's like all right then let's go way back it's like every day I'm gonna go there it's like every day's Disneyland eh? the the uh the aquarium take us back to the oh, aquarium the, the digital That's aquarium story. yeah this is a great story uh so when I was graduating college I was getting my degree in, in, in computer science shout out to Georgia State I was just trying to figure out what was I doing. I had already went to bartending school. I had already tried to get a job in corporate America, got fired, you know, just what am I going to do with myself? And my friend was like, hey, Georgia State just opened a di this place called the Digital Aquarium. I'm like, man, I am broke, dog. You think I got time to go to an aquarium? <laughs> I thought you was going to tell me where we could get some money from. And he's like, nah, man, it's like this computer lab. You should check it out. And I was like, bro, didn't I tell you I need to figure out how to pay my rent? I don't have time for nothing other than that. And one of these days, I just got off my high horse and just walked over there. And I walked into the lab and I was just like, are you kidding me? Like, this is what the digital aquarium was? It was a brand new state-of-the-art computer lab. It was almost like walking into an Apple store almost 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. You know that vibe when you walk into the Apple store and there's all these new computers and there's cameras and it's just like, use it. Yeah, go ahead, you can use it. Whatever you want to do. Screens, whatever you need. I'm just standing there looking like. Playground. Like, I can Playground. use this stuff. Playground. And they was and like, guess. The gods are above, like, <laughs> and yeah. they were like, guess what? This is all included in your technology fee. So I'm just thinking to myself, 
So I can come here every day and use this stuff. They was like, yeah, and guess what? We have laptops that you can check out and we have Canon cameras that you can use and XLRs and a music studio in the back with Pro Tools and little booths if you need privacy. And we have PC and Mac, all the new Adobe stuff, Macromedia before it got acquired, just every, every single thing you needed to teach yourself how to become a multimedia designer, producer, director, whatever. And I moved, I literally moved into that lab for two years straight. I was in that lab every single day. I don't think there's one Doing student, the work. I don't think there's one student who used that lab more than I did over that two year time frame. I ended up also even getting a job there as well to help put money in my pocket because I still needed to make money, but I still needed to learn. Mm -hmm. So instead of me going from just being a student there, I became an employee there. So I was still teaching people, but I was still working on my own stuff and still learning and having access to that much resource and that much talent around me, I decided to start a design agency because I saw after, because I originally wanted to do music videos. I, I really wanted to be like Hype Williams. I love hip hop, you know, shout out to Big E. I was like, man, I want to shoot music videos. I got the eye for it, trust me. And it was like a bunch of other people doing music videos. And I was like, man, my stuff just don't look as good as theirs. And they got all this time in front of me. And I'm like, I started to feel myself being like, damn, am I like falling behind? And I was like, well, you know what? Don't nobody know how to make websites. Don't nobody know how to do graphics and stuff like that. So you know what? Maybe I'll just go from this side of the lab to the other side. Because nobody's over here on this side. Yeah. Right, side of the right, store. pivot. Boom. Like nobody's sitting over here using these tools and these machines and stuff like that. So that's when I started doing like graphic design. And then I started to work with my video guys where I would help them do the graphics for their videos. And then I was like, you know what? Forget video. I need to do more like graphic design stuff. Maybe I can start doing some logos. I can charge like maybe 50 bucks. I could do flyers and stuff. I can make like some money. And it started to take off. People needed that more than they needed video work. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, I'm like, whew, I landed my first website, which was a furniture website for a small independent like eclectic furniture company and they paid us $3,500 and I was so nervous that they were gonna like change their mind and ask for their check back and I was so it was almost like I was scared the first day that they gave because this is real money now yeah. none of the video boys had ever made $3,500 I didn't know anybody that had ever gotten a check for $3,500 for any service or skill that they could say that they could do for somebody and that check cleared with no problem and I was working on the website and I'm like man trying to get this figured and I'm like man if I could get 35 from this what if I could I could get 5,000 or maybe I can get two 3,500s at the same time. And that's when I started to realize, oh no, I got a business. This isn't a hobby no more. This is a business because people are really paying me. And then I ended up working with two more people who had went to Morehouse because I went to Morehouse first, but I couldn't really afford Morehouse because I was paying for college on my own. So because I had moved to Georgia, I was a Georgia resident. So I went to Georgia State and my tuition got cut like 90% because I was in state, it was a public school, but I ended up going back to work with two cats from Morehouse and with their connections, we started to just, the business just blew up. Went from working on just a little computer there to now we have real estate developers in New York City, we're working with uh, Def Jam, we're working with all of these established companies because we were at the forefront of this multimedia advertising web thing. And kept doing that agency, ended up getting in front of this, this African-American VC venture family based out of Pennsylvania. They wanted to actually acquire the design agency, have us come in-house. So it was like an aqua hire. They, they brought us out. We, we became their in-house agency, did all of their stuff, which was great because they were still doing a lot of amazing things as well as they put up angel funding for me to build my first product, which was a content management system for like independent artists. Cause I've always been about monetization. I've always been about making money. You have to make money. Am I greedy? No, but am I smart? Yeah, money makes the world go round. And few people want to be the one to say, I know how to make money. And few people can actually say that they know how to make money legitimately, you know what I mean? Not scamming or frauding, legitimately, I know how to monetize something. Few people can do that. So I've been doing it for so long 
that when I got to that point where somebody gave me some money to build something, I was like, I'm about to help everybody monetize their stuff. Mm -hmm. So this was before uh, Spotify launched. Yeah. This was like right after MySpace. This was Facebook pages was out, but people didn't really even know how to use Facebook pages. It wasn't really made for independent artists and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Nobody was live streaming. I was like, man, we need to start live streaming. That's the future. So I've just always been on the cusp of technology because I don't want to be behind it. Mm -hmm. So the computer, so the digital aquarium, I feel really was one of those groundbreaking moments that gave me that opportunity. And now I look back and I try to mimic that, not that exact same thing, but that support that yeah. the digital aquarium gave me, I now give back to my community, whether it's setting up programs for emerging creatives at Netflix or re-entry programs at Coursera or helping getting HBCUs onto Coursera or whether it's having like 100 plus mentees or whether it's public speaking. It's just all of that support that I feel I got from the Digital Aquarium and I see how much of an impact it had on me. I wanna be that Digital Aquarium for yeah. other people yeah. as opposed to it just being a lab, just the support that I needed that it gave me to get where I wanna go. I wanna be that for my community so it's just been so much fun to do that and to see that i can do it at like even a bigger scale than i ever thought i would so i love that you talk about how much you mentor and so given some of our audience i'd like to ask you a question from their point of view so let's say i am somebody in an organization that's trying to make a pivot in how they work from like old school it the business has the requirements, they schlep them over the wall and I build stuff, right? And they're trying to make this pivot to do, not what you do, but to do something like it, to take responsibility, control for the stuff that they're building. And it may not be as awesome as right. movies and, right? It may be an expense app for right. my people. Like how, What's your counsel? What's your guidance for some for an organization that's looking at like to even get halfway to where you're at, like in in how you all work? Because they they're not supposed to become Netflix. Right. They're, we always talk about it. What are they supposed to become? A better version, right? So so what's that? What counsel would you give somebody who's trying to make a change and how they think about what they what they build in technology? That's a good question. I'm trying to think of how I really want to answer that because I feel like nowadays a lot of stuff comes down to like the culture like mm -hmm. the team has to understand why the company wants to do that and the team has to be on board with that because it's going to take everybody's support it's not that's one thing I realized is that at Netflix I can't just find a problem and then be like I'm gonna pass it to my manager but hey can you solve this she's gonna look back at me and be like can you solve it? I mean, you're the one who said it was a problem. And I'm like, you know what? You know what? That's right. That's empowerment. The counsel I would give them is get your team aligned. Spend that time getting your team grounded and level set on the same page on the principles, the direction of where the company's going. Get everybody bought in on something so that it's not just directions I'm giving you. It's almost like yeah, you know how to get there, but you know what? You're so interested. You want to go the long way to get there. You're not even looking just the fast way to get there because you're so bought into it. If you're not bought into it, you want to go the shortest way possible because you want to do something else. Where I think at Netflix, during the hiring process, so another question to answer this is, this goes all the way back to the hiring process. You got to make sure you're hiring the right people. Right. Yeah. Not just the right people skill-wise, but the right people like psychologically, emotionally, that want to be there so that they're going to give you that extra that you need mm -hmm. to build the culture that you want. Because it's not easy to build a culture and it's damn sure not easy to change one. You know what I mean? Right. And I don't think you can put the pressure on, even if you are the senior director or the VP, I don't think it happens from one person. And I'm seeing that now at Netflix, I'm trying to make some cultural changes and I'm seeing, I got to get buy-in from all of my team and that's just not easy because you may not agree with what I'm saying at this moment, or y'all might have different views, but I want everybody aligned. So now I got to understand what you're saying, maybe compromise with you. I got to introduce what you saying to her. I got to introduce what y'all saying to each other. We three got to get on the same page. This has nothing to do with leadership yet, because we can't go to leadership if we don't have our act together yet. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like you have to get everybody and the alignment is so hard. And I think that's the part that companies and teams forget is that you- 
Yeah, or they try, but they can't get there because they can't translate what they're saying to each other. Right. Right. And so, like, in bringing problems to the forefront, how do you know that they're even the right problems to solve? Like, shouldn't you only be focused on the things that are solving the obsession metric for the company? Like, how do you make sure that you're not off solving the wrong things that really don't matter? Right. I mean, well, we have strategy bets as a company. So regardless, I feel we have massive, wide, super wide guardrails that mm -hmm. just prevent you from just going off into deep space. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's like strategy bets, but the strategy bets aren't... And those aren't, are your guardrails? It's like within those strategy Right, but the strategy bets aren't just for the monetization team. It's like Netflix. It's mm -hmm. like the, the C-suite of Netflix, the top leaders of Netflix, every year we have these strategy bets that kind of loosely say where we want the company to go. They're not super loose like make more money. It's like increase revenue in EMEA because X, Y, Z, you know? So now what does that mean though? Whose team is that responsible for? Y'all figure that out. We just said we need to increase the revenue in EMEA. The C-suite at Netflix doesn't feel like they have to say, I'm talking to your team, Alexis. Your team is listening and saying, they're talking to us. We know they're talking to us. So we're going to take that. We need to increase the revenue in EMEA and go figure out how to do that. So we, so, but you see how loosely of a guardrail that is? They didn't say how to do it. They didn't say how much. They just said increase. So now whether you want to interpret that increase as 200%, which is almost unbelievable, or 2%, that's up to you. Use the resources you have. Use your stunning colleagues. Figure out how to increase it in the media and what that actually means. You make the decision on is it 2% or is it 200%. So it's like sometimes I can't even believe the power and impact that I have at Netflix. It's still just sometimes, I'm just too humble of a person. I'm just, I, I just have too much humility to think that Netflix has given me and my team the control to make those type of decisions. So we prioritize based on loosely the strategy bet, and then what does it take to, to solve that strategy bet? And do you tick and tie it? I mean, is there a formal way you tick and tie it? Or it's just, we're on, it's culture. So your system is culture. Right. Then it isn't a it isn't a dogma, it isn't a process. That's it's what I think. Culture. That's from my perspective, yeah. right? Because I think all of that goes under culture. It's like yeah. process goes under culture. You know what I'm saying? Like all, all that goes under there. And I think the culture is to, I mean, it says it in the culture deck. It says, do the best for Netflix. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, do the best for our customers as well. So by doing that, I'm like, well, how do I make the best experience? How do we make the best experience? What's most, in, what's the biggest pain point for our audience right now? Cause that's what we need to be solving. We don't just need to be picking something randomly off a of backlog. Mm -hmm. We're like, okay, well, what? So according to the strategy bets, we want to improve in this area. Okay. Now let's dive in and see what's, what's going on in that area. Are we sluggish in that area? Are we doing well in that area? How do we use this data to find out what's important in that area? And then now that we found out what's important, let's prioritize of those things what's important. And the prioritization, once again, is democratic. We're sitting down together talking about these are the things that I think we should work on, engineering things, this. I think Netflix over the last three years has given product design a lot more input and say on things. So I can say, I think we should do this. I think we should do that. And if I can back it up and I have the support of my team or the peers, we may end up actually doing that. And I think that's great where once again, it comes back to empowerment, which goes under culture. So I would say the culture is to bring this question all the way back. If you want to talk about how to turn something around, get your culture together. Thank you all for joining us for Scaling Enterprise Agility, a podcast from Atlassian and Accenture. Thank you as well to our special guest, Fonz Morris of Netflix, for sharing his insights today. You can check out more about Fonz as well as the work Atlassian and Accenture are doing on Enterprise Agility using the links in our show notes. We'll be back with more conversations soon. Follow us now in your podcast app and you won't miss an episode.